Okay, we're reading from the first book of Thessalonians. Am I on here? Yep. Okay. The message about the Lord rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place. The news about your faithfulness to God has spread so that we don't even need to mention it. People tell us about what sort of welcome we have from you and how you turn to God from idols. As a result, you are serving the living and true God and you are waiting for his son from heaven. His son is Jesus, who is the one he raised from the dead and who is the one who will rescue us from the coming wrath. God didn't intend for us to suffer his wrath, but rather to possess salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus died for us, whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. So continue encouraging each other and building each other up, just like you are doing already. Brothers and sisters, we ask you to respect those who are working with you, leading you, and instructing you. Think of them highly with love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are disorderly, comfort the discouraged, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure no one repays a wrong with a wrong, but always pursue the good for each other and everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in every situation because this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. Don't suppress the spirit. Don't brush off spirit-inspired messages, but examine everything carefully and hang on to what is good. May the reading and hearing of God's words be blessed today. Amen. Now, let us turn to Psalm 4 and spend time with God as we watch today's ancient psalm reading. I rest in you, O God. I am in your safekeeping. Body and soul held in peace. My heart cries out to you, my God. All that upsets me, you see. All that disturbs me, you understand. Only here, in your presence, am I fully known. I am wrapped in grace. I rest in you. body and soul held in peace. I try to relax, but anger rattles me. I try to relax, but my feelings niggle at me. Be still. Be silent. Put your trust in the Lord. I rest in you. of your face shines. My heart turns to thankfulness and is glad. I have more than enough. You, Lord, are more than enough. I lie down to sleep, safe and sound. I rest in you, O God. I am in your safekeeping, body and soul held in peace. Be still and rest. You are held in peace.
Wow, it's hard to go into a children's sermon after that. <laughs> but the children's sermon today has a message for kids about taking time to be still in God. And I think it's one that a lot of us can use. I came across something called sensory bottles. It seems to be a thing on the internet. Of course, there's so many things on the internet, it's hard to keep up with all of them. But this one seemed pretty interesting. And a lot of parents are starting to use this with their kids during timeouts. Now, for those of you kids who are watching, sometimes I know you get angry or you get sad, and sometimes you don't know what to do with the feelings you have. It's a lot. It overwhelms you, and you kind of start acting out, and then mom and dad gets mad. And sometimes they have you go sit down in a corner for a while. Sometimes they call that a timeout. Well, I came across a new way of doing a timeout. I've got a bottle. It looks like it's kind of gray and filled with maybe a little bit of glitter, but it doesn't look very interesting. But if I shake it, there is beautiful glitter floating all around in this bottle. But the thing about it is that what is in the bottle isn't water. There's some water in it, but there's some other stuff in, too, in it too, some chemical things, some soap, some other things that there's some science behind it, and it creates a substance that's thicker than water. And if you watch this slowly, and if you pay attention, over three or four minutes, very slowly, all that glitter starts to fall back down to the bottom. You can see at the very top, it's starting to be kind of a boring gray color again. And I'm going to leave it here, and we can watch. But what some kids do is they take this, and when they get really upset about something and they're just having a hard time, they take one of these and they go to a corner of the house, and they shake it up, and then they sit and they watch as it slowly settles back down. And as we watch the glitter settle, it reminds us that all of us sometimes have times where we start feeling really jumbled inside, and we need to take time to just sit and be with God to be still, to be at peace, and to just wait and watch God at work. So as we watch the glitter continue to settle down a little bit more by a little bit more, let us pray. Dear God, you are always with us, no matter what we are feeling, no matter what we're going through. Remind us, no matter what we're feeling, that we can always be at peace with you. You love us no matter what. Remind us to take time to sit and be still and to be filled with your love. In your name we pray, holy God. Amen. Unhurried spirit. Isn't that a lovely theme for this new service? of worship, unhurried. Isn't that what we really look for in our lives? A time of rest, of relaxing, of chilling in the summertime. So the next few weeks, we're going to be moving into the New Testament as part of our reading project of going through the Bible this year. And I think it's a great time for us to adjust the rhythm of our lives, to figure out where we're going and how we're getting there, and what our tempo is, what our rhythm is. Next slide. As many of you know, I've been on vacation for a couple weeks. And the first week, I went backpacking on the Colorado Trail in Colorado. Now, it's almost 500 miles long. My sister and I did about 25 miles, uh, maybe 30. Um, and uh, we were at altitudes between about 7,000 and 8,300 feet. Uh, it, was, it was a lot. It was a heavy pack with all of our food and water. There were two days where there were no water stops on the trail, and so we had to carry enough water to get through two days and 10 miles of high altitude hiking through an area that had been burned out. So there was no trees and no shade in that area. My sister, regretfully, miscalculated her water, and she ended up carrying like 25 pounds of water, which was twice what she needed to carry, and she discovered that's a lot of weight to carry on the trail. But we all have mistakes. We all have to take time. One of the biggest things we learned was that there's a tempo when you're hiking. 
that you have to find based on your own body, the altitude, the temperature, the weight you're carrying, whether you're going up or going down. And if you don't find the right tempo, you just feel terrible. And nothing works right. We have to be patient and we have to find our own pace and rhythms. So as I was on this trail, I thought a lot about Jesus and Paul because when you go through the New Testament, they walked everywhere. There were a few boats across the Sea of Galilee, maybe a few boats across the Mediterranean, but Paul and Jesus walked and walked and walked. And walking is a time to think, to spend time with God, to chat with your companions. And so I think as we start this, I want us to think about that walking that everyone in the New Testament did and to see ourselves on that same spiritual journey of walking with them. So today, I'd like to cover three points as we get started in the New Testament. I want to provide some context to the New Testament, especially for those who have been in the Hebrew Bible for so long. It can be a little bit jarring to have a new cultural context. And we're also going to talk a little bit about interpreting the Bible. So in the slide, you see one of the amphitheaters from the days that Paul was in Thessalonica. You can still go visit this today. Thessalonica is a booming, thriving city in Greece today. But Paul was living in a very particular time. And as we start in the New Testament, the first thing I want to say is that uh, we're going to start with the seven letters that we know Paul wrote himself. The reason we're doing this is this gives us a look into how our understanding of Jesus grew and how small faith communities grew into formal churches. We don't have absolute dates on every writing in the New Testament, but there's a strong consensus for most of the order of the writings, and that's what we're going to be following here. Uh, I believe Jane made some paper copies of the reading plan for this summer. It's also posted on Facebook and our website for anyone who wants to follow along. It may seem that we are jumping around the New Testament because the Bible did not put the books in the New Testament based according to chronological order. But I think that by doing this in the order they were written, we're going to get an insight into these early believers, into their growing understanding of who Jesus was and what his message means for the world. Which brings up the question, so what is the order that's in the Bible that we carry around? And it is kind of interesting. So in the Bible, the first four books are the Gospels, which tell us about the life of Jesus. Now, for someone who doesn't know anything about Jesus, this is important, putting the Gospels first. I think that was a good choice. Not that anyone asked me. And then comes the book of Acts, which is a history book of the early church. And then we have all these writings, these letters that went out to communities and people in the New Testament. The interesting thing there is that they decided to order them based on a letter to a community went first, and then the letters to individuals were second. And then they were all put in the order of how long the letters were. So basically, most of the New Testament is put together based on how long how many words were in a, in a letter? Now, you can think whatever you want about that ordering. It has worked for a long time. But for us reading through, one of the things, those of us who were reading through the prophets, we're like, this is jumping all over the place. Because the prophets in the Hebrew Bible were also not in chronological order. And a lot of us got very confused. Because there was stuff from before the Assyrians destroyed Israel. There was stuff from before the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem. And then we'd be in the Persian Empire a couple hundred years later. And then we'd jump back. It was very confusing. So for the New Testament, we're going to do a chronological read this summer. And just walk with the people as they came to understand this new understanding of God that Jesus had presented. As we start to read the New Testament letters, I want us to remember a couple things. One is we are eavesdropping on incomplete conversations. So when Paul starts writing to the Thessalonians, which was about 50 AD or common era, 
he'd already been there. He knew everyone there. He had already told them all about Jesus. They knew something about Jesus. They were living as a new faith community as Paul went on to talk to a new community. So there's a whole conversation that we don't have in writing because Paul said it in person and they all heard it. And then we get this one letter because he heard some things from a friend, so he writes him a letter. And there is a second letter, much, much later, which probably was not actually written by Paul. But we didn't really hear a response from the Thessalonians. We don't know what they thought of the letter they got from Paul. We don't know what happened after that letter. So we have an incomplete conversation that we're listening to. But I want us to remember that while they are incomplete conversations, the early church found these instructions very useful and relevant. There were lots of letters that got sent to lots of places, and we don't have all of them. Sometimes we have references to a letter that we don't have. For example, in 1 Corinthians, it's clear there was a pre-1 Corinthians, a first 1 Corinthians that we don't have. The Hebrew Bible has references to texts we don't have as well. But these texts were so meaningful to the early believers that they took the time to find someone who could write. They took the time to find someone who had enough money to buy some parchment, some papyrus. They took the time to hand copy these letters and send them on to other faith communities. They felt the spirit moving in these letters, and they saved them, and they shared them. And I think that's where our inspiration from these letters is still founded. We can still feel the spirit moving in them, and we can still share their wisdom. So the last bit of local context that I'd like to share, just so that we're really grounded as we start reading this, these early believers, we often call it the early church, but I don't know if it was really a church the way we think of a church. It was really not organized. By 50 AD, there were maybe two, maybe 3,000 believers total across the Eastern Mediterranean. That's it. In any particular location, there were maybe 50 or 60 people. Jerusalem had maybe a few hundred. But we're not talking about large, organized groups of people. There's no institutional church. They don't have any rules for who's a pastor and what's a church and how to do communion and what to do with the offering. None of that exists yet. It's a bunch of people who are hungry for God's message, hungry for Jesus in their life. So that's the context of the early believers and this kind of a house church tradition. They really met in homes. There's also a Jewish context, because a lot of the early believers came from a Jewish background, or they first heard about God through Jewish people they knew. And the Jewish context that we need to remember is there were a lot of sub-traditions. Some of them were familiar with from reading the Gospels, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. There were some other groups called the Zealots. Judas, the betrayer, was a zealot. Uh, the Essenes were another group, and they were the ones who left us the Dead Sea Scrolls that have been so useful for us. So the Jewish community was not a monolithic, unified group of people. But they did have two core convictions that were a part of the early believers' understanding of where Jesus came from and what God was trying to do in the world. One was that the Jews had a very radical monotheism. Now that sounds like big seminary talk. What it means is they absolutely, totally, completely believed in only one God. Now they lived in a world of the Greek and Roman gods. The ancient Egyptian gods were still around. There were hundreds of gods with temples everywhere. And most people, kind of like donors to political parties today, most people gave a donation and a prayer to a lot of God, a lot of gods to cover all of their bases. You know, just like some companies give to both the Republicans and Democrats to make sure they're covered, they would worship Apollo and Isis and 
Venus, and you know, the list goes on and on and on and on. Jews had one God, period. Which got them into some political trouble because they were a bunch of emperors who thought they were God. And so there were political and economic ramifications for this radical monotheism. The other conviction that the Jews had that I think we still hold on to is they had an absolute belief in the promise and hope that came from God's covenants with Abraham. They believed they were the children of Abraham and all that God promised to Abraham was still available to them as heirs. The final context is Jesus, Paul, the early believers, they were in the Roman Empire. And we hear a lot about Rome these days, especially the fall of Rome. And, but I'm not sure we really understand what life was like on a daily basis in Rome. Rome was utterly dominant. I'm not sure that there's any country in our world today that has the same political, economic, and military dominance. Even the United States, I don't think, compares to what Rome had in their community, in their part of the world at this time. They maintained their power through tremendous violence, and it was not just the violence of the army coming through and smashing everything up like they did with the temple in AD 70, after Jesus was gone, and shortly before the Gospel of Mark was written. There was a violence on the personal level, because they had a, another thing, was a rigid social hierarchy. There was eight or nine different levels of who people were organized into. And there was no way to move from one level to another. There was no upward social mobility like we think we have here in the United States. You were stuck where you were born, and that was it. And the higher level elites used their own personal ability of violence to maintain the people in their household, in their community, in their proper places. So when we're looking at this ancient group of new believers in Thessalonia, people would be gathering in this amphitheater to worship, to see plays and circuses, to gather as community, but when you became a follower of Jesus, you weren't really welcome at that amphitheater anymore. You weren't welcome in your family. All of your social connections were broken. You didn't believe the emperor was God, so you were in kind of a little trouble that sometimes was full-blown persecution, sometimes it was just annoying oppression. But every part of your life became different when you became a follower of Jesus. Because nothing about following Jesus fit with the Roman Empire at this time. Next slide. Now some of you are saying, you know, 1 Thessalonians, I'm not sure I've even ever heard of this book in the Bible. It's not one that's read very often or referred to very often. It doesn't have a huge influence. What it is, is a pastoral letter offering support and encouraging people who are struggling with the persecution of being new believers. The message is to encourage and support each other. That Jesus is standing with you. Jesus is going to come back. You are taken care of by God. It acknowledges that following Jesus is hard. This new way of life is not easy. Now there is one section of this book that some people in the last 150 years have started reading a lot more, and it's the end of chapter 4. And it addresses the concern that people who have died in Thessalonica, believers who have died, will not be around when Jesus returns. Paul is addressing a pastoral concern of real fears of anxiety. And he's offering hope and comfort. Because in reality, Paul was so excited by Jesus, he was so passionate about the transformation that Jesus brings to people's lives, that he believed that Jesus was coming soon, that he himself would see the return of Jesus in his own life. And he figured most people alive were going to see Jesus come back. And he was really excited about this, and so then people were like, yeah, but 
My brother in faith, my sister in faith just died. They're not going to see Jesus. What's going to happen to them? Paul's like, don't worry. Everyone's going to be lifted up. Jesus will be with everyone. Paul offered pastoral comfort to people under persecution. The thing is, this last chapter, uh, or the last section of chapter 4, there are five chapters in the book, has now been used to talk about something called the rapture. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the Left Behind books and movies that were popular a few years ago. There's this branch of Christianity that talks a lot about this rapture that is coming soon and is going to be this time where holy, pure people are going to be whisked away to heaven leaving other people behind. And there's going to be a seven-year period, and then maybe some more people will be accepted into heaven. The thing is, a lot of people have gotten very nervous about the rapture. Am I going to be one of the people taken? Am I going to be with Jesus? The thing is, this is not a tradition of Christianity or an ancient belief. It started in the 1800s with a guy named John Nelson Darby. The whole rapture thing is 150 years old. It is popular in a couple branches of evangelical and Pentecostal Christianity. And this is about the only section of Thessalonians that a lot of people even think about much these days, even though it is a very calming and pastoral book. And so this leads me to the other thing I want to talk about today, because I think this sets the groundwork for moving into the New Testament. How do we interpret the Bible? There's a group of people that is looking for certainty, for black and white, clear answers. And they're like, every word in the Bible is absolutely true, and they're all equal to each other. Well, then what do you do with this section where clearly Paul is wrong? Jesus did not show up in their lifetime. Does that mean we throw out everything Paul said? Because one thing's wrong? Or is there another way of looking at interpreting the Bible where we have to spend time wrestling and trying to figure out there is a divine inspiration that led someone to write this down. And this is a profound experience for them with an important message for their community. What is the inspiration, the divine inspiration that we can take from their experience and their context and apply to our life today. Now when you look at the graphic I have, someone's clearly trying to jam God into the Bible. Come on, God, you just have to fit in there. Are we reading the Bible and trying to fit our understanding of God into the limitations of a book? Or are we taking the Bible and letting the Spirit inspire us to see God at work in new ways in our world? Do we think God is still speaking to us and people around us today? Are we trying to figure out who God is in our lives and how we all fit together? So I think Thessalonians shows us the ways that the early church encouraged and comforted each other. And I think there are ways that the Bible can continue to comfort us today. And I think it also shows us that there are things that are tough to read in there that don't always make sense. And it, I think it encourages us to come together as a community of believers, just like those early believers did, and try to figure this stuff out together. Try to be in the Spirit, try to listen for God's voice, try to see where God is at work today. Let's take three minutes and have some conversations among ourselves. Um, if we were online, we would do this in the chat room as well, but that's not working today, so today we'll just do it in person here. Uh, there'll be a timer started in a minute here because I know... These are topics that we could go far longer than three minutes, and you're certainly encouraged to continue the conversation after church today. But, you know, you can talk about whatever you want, but perhaps some prompts would be, where are the times that you have found comfort in the Bible, and are you struggling with the ways to interpret and understand God through the Bible today?
Oh, it's always so sad to get the three minutes done and want to just keep going. So please do continue the conversation. Uh, you know, feel free to have lunch together, get together during the week, and continue talking. Um, I just heard a great comment from one group about tolerating the mystery and just, you know, being in that space of just not having all the answers all the time. So as we walk with Jesus this summer, let's listen to Paul's instruction along our journey. He provided a radical message to a new faith community to love one another, encourage and support everyone at all times. This went against Jewish tradition, which placed God's chosen people above everyone else, and it went against Roman tradition, which placed family and village and citizenship above other people. So can we love one another today? Can we love people we disagree with or who disagree with us? Can we be beacons of hope in our culture today? As we go this week, I invite all of you to receive the pastoral comfort of Paul for whatever struggles you face as you live in the faith of Jesus Christ. Amen. What wondrous love is this, oh my soul, oh my soul What wondrous love is this, oh my soul What wondrous love is this That calls the Lord of bliss To bear the dreadful curse of my soul of an action, or we just need to break the intensity. Perhaps we are spiraling emotionally and need some perspective. Perhaps we just need to get quiet and still so we can change the course of action. In this worship series, we're going to give ourselves a time out. This time out during our prayer time will be a time for letting go of the things we do not need that are weighing us down. This is sometimes known as confession, assurance, and petition in church language. 
These three ways of reconnecting with God are ancient and make so much sense. In confession, we let go of regret about the past, unburdening our hearts. Then we remember the promise and assurance that God will never abandon us, no matter what, even when sometimes we are the ones who have been distant. And in petitions, we let go of worry about the things we cannot control and worry about the future, giving it all to the loving God who holds us close and rocks us gently. Let us pray together. For the times when we have run ourselves and others ragged, forgive us. For the times when we have asked of ourselves too much or too little, forgive us. Help us find the right tempos for the right times, O oh God. Help us be gentle in our learning and growing with ourselves and with others. Help us step back when the toxic and overbearing pace of life that we believe we must adhere to in order to live up to some external idea that threatens to tear down our connections to life, love, and to you. In this moment, we hear your promise. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. You do not ask us to destroy ourselves in order to please you. We are your children, created by you, with whom you are pleased, just because. We now bring our petitions to you this day, O oh God. Here are the people and things we are worried about and yet know we cannot control. I invite you to speak aloud the petitions on your hearts or keep them within your hearts and minds. I'd like to open with a petition that our justice team has been working on and lift up the teenage leaders from Logan High School with the Black Student Leaders Group and their bravery and courage to work towards justice in their school. I pray for a little baby named Max. I lift up Miles a child in our congregation who has been having troubles with his lungs. Let us complete our prayers with the one Jesus taught us based on the version from the book of Matthew. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Today is one of the special Sundays in the United Methodist tradition where we collect an additional offering for the ministries that connect Methodists around the world. Today is Peace with Justice Sunday. If you would like to make a donation, you can use the envelopes um, that are spread around and just write peace or justice on them so we know that's the designation. If you are giving online, uh, you can use the designate button and put in uh, Peace with Justice. Um, you can also give regular donations at this time, and um, we can collect them in the basket that's here in the center, um, or you can give online. One thing I love about the United Methodist Church is that we really like to put our words to action. We're not only in the pews, but we're also out in the streets, and that's true all across the world. Engaging in the wider world is in our DNA as Methodists. The history of the United Methodist Church has been one that has always stood for justice. From the time of John Wesley and his commitment to prison reform, to young people not having to work, and many of the issues that faced the church in England, um, is that history out of which we grew. And as people of faith who believe that um, 
humankind and individuals move on to perfection, but that we are always moving in God's grace, being perfected by God, not only for ourselves, but for the society, it makes us a church that is unique in many ways. Our personal piety is not separated from our social commitments. And it is lived out and has been lived out for 250 years in a way that connects faith and life, connects church and society, connects justice and peace. And it's the thing that makes me most proud of being United Methodist. Whether it is educating people about the social principles, organizing communities to create positive change, or advocating with decision makers, we work to make disciples for the transformation of the world. United Methodists around the world are continuing this tradition of living faith, seeking justice, pursuing peace. What I love about the United Methodist Church is that we stand for justice for eradicating poverty, climate justice, migrants and refugees, non-proliferation of weapons, for racial justice, for education for all, addiction care, for gun violence prevention, for maternal and child health, economic justice, indigenous rights, religious freedom, sustainability, fair trade, for criminal justice reform, healthy food for all, human trafficking prevention, women and children, environmental justice, for civil rights, for domestic violence prevention, for mental health, for LGBTQ rights, peace with justice, multilateralism, voting rights, for worker justice, health care, for clean water, an AIDS-free world, for living wages, abolishing the death penalty, for human rights, for the dignity of all people, United Methodists stand for justice, for justice, for justice, for justice, United Methodists stand, stand for justice. justice.
May the tempo of your journey be just right this week. May you seize the day, but also savor the moment. May your life be the one you live and not just watch passing by. And may you be reacquainted each day with an unhurried God who is calling you to dive deeply into peace. Go now in love. Amen.